Um, we're going to get started, even though we're technically not ready to get started. Um, welcome to Innovating in the Studio Techniques for Recording Lecture Videos. Um, I'm your moderator, Leslie Maxfield. I'm the Director of Academic Media Technologies at Caltech in Pasadena, California. And um, panelists and I are so happy to be here with our partners to share our knowledge, our lessons learned, and ideas for innovation to basically come up with successful MOOC recordings. Um, when we got together to figure out what we wanted to share with you, turned out we had some common themes at our universities that we, that we share, some challenges. So we thought that should be the focus of this panel. So our outcomes are to share that discussion with you, and of course to get your questions answered um, and your ideas on those themes as well. Um, another outcome is hopefully um, to synthesize what comes from this panel and other things that we learned from um, this partners conference um, and add it to the MOOC on MOOCs Coursera site so then um, everybody has a resource about great lecture recordings and how we can do better. Um, so do we still not have slides? We still no longer have slides. So um, we're going to do some quick intros, um, then we're going to talk about five themes We'll do some Q&A and discussion, and then before you leave, you should definitely take away um, each of our favorite tips uh, that we want to share with you. So let's do some quick Q&A. Or introductions. Introductions. Yeah. introductions. Or combination. <laughs> well, Guess I mean, who I am. The right? Q&A. Yeah. Are we going to have a screen, or are we going to not have a screen? There you go. So, oh, yeah. okay. I'll, I'll take that. Um, hi, all. Welcome. Uh, we're going to make the introductions really quick because, oh, wow, dramatic. Uh, lighting matters. My name is Stace Carter. I'm with the University of Virginia. I'm a producer there and also an instructor there. Uh, and I'm working on two MOOC courses right now. The Modern World is a history class with Professor Philip Zelico and Know Thyself, a philosophy class with Professor Mitch Green. Hi, I'm Laura Shadoff. I'm an instructional um, technologist at the Princeton University McGraw Center for Teaching and Learning. That was a mouthful. Uh, I work with faculty to develop and administer their Coursera courses, research new technologies they can use in their teaching, and coordinate with our broadcast center to produce and manage the entire uh, video assets for the project. Thank you. Hi, I'm Libby Evans from Duke University, and I um, manage the video production for Duke. Um, we work in collaboration with our Center for Instructional Technology on the pedagogy end, and I'm really glad to be here with y'all. And then my background, um, I run the AV team at Caltech. We do all of the video recording, lecture recording, and marketing videos uh, for the university. So for us, MOOCs came out of nowhere. Um, we did support a MOOC before we joined, joined Coursera as a partner, and with Coursera we've done three MOOCs um, and completed those. So let's learn about you guys. Um, how many in the audience are MOOC instructors? Great. And how many of you have recorded lectures? Great. And then how many of you are the support staff behind our MOOC instructors? Fantastic. And then who are those who help support the financial side of that <laughs> support staff? You guys are all important to this effort. <laughs> and did I miss any really important component? I guess the Coursera staff who are here as well. And who um, helps get them. Yeah, and, who help, <laughs> and who've been really great technical uh, support staff um, for, for, the, for our partners. So great. It's a good mix. So it's mostly um, the support staff in making these recordings happen. So our first theme is, and isn't that just great over there? Um, so some of our universities, there's a proposal process. So we wanted to talk about kind of the first step is how do you choose the right MOOC instructors? Um, so I was going to have you guys talk about that. At my university, we don't have that proposal process. So how do you get the best with what you have to work with? So let's talk about that proposal process and how you select great MOOC instructors. Yeah, and I'll start that one off. Um, one of the things that we did at University of Virginia was it was, I think, What's common with a lot of us here is like, wow, this is new, and this was kind of we didn't see it coming. Um, although I think probably all of us have, have been working in online education probably for decades, right? Um, so one of the things that we took into account at the university is to find top talent, right? To find really good teachers that would represent the university well, prospective students, and who we thought would be really effective in that medium, and we're finding great success with that. So I think you know, just my my personal take on this is that. 
as with, you know, it, whether you're making a feature film or a MOOC, talent really matters. And the talent in front of the camera is going to make all the difference. So we're going to talk a little bit about how to make them comfortable, too. And if you were in this session that was in this room right before us, there was some great commentary on that. Um, but you know, we do have a proposal process at UVA. Part of that is what are the resources that are going to be involved with creating this MOOC, because that's important for time management and budgeting and setting expectations. But the other one is how much do you understand about this as an instructor? And you know, are you somebody we know and somebody that can really kind of make the most of this medium for the university and for the students that are going to be taking that class? And at Princeton, they, uh, the process is the same. The, uh, we were one of the first partners. and. Uh, the instructors that were involved volunteered to do this, so it's not uh, we're not picking from a list of them. And at this point now, they're submitting proposals uh, with their class, what they want to do, and um, and they're being selected that way. And at Duke University, we're actually beginning our second round of courses, um, and there is a proposal process for this round. Um, it, uh, faculty submitted who were interested submitted a proposal describing the course following a, a template. Um, and then a faculty committee reviewed those proposals and um, decided which ones would move forward um, which, to the second stage of the proposal and which ones we needed to get more information from before they moved to the second stage. We're in the second stage right now. Um, and that includes, among other things, the faculty creating sample materials. Um, one of the things that we realized in the first round is that it's really easy for faculty to sign on to doing this without realizing the work that's involved. And so part of the goal of the proposal process this time around is to give them a taste of what it's actually like to create the kinds of videos that we create. So I mean, at Caltech, we haven't had the proposal process in our first round. And um, of course, every MOOC was different. Every instructor is different with their own comfort level and personalities. And um, so we had to be flexible and open and ready to support that. So we did a MOOC which was in front of a live classroom because that's what energized that uh, instructor to be able to be on camera. We also had to live broadcast it because he felt like if it was live, then he could like stop and do a retake. Um, and then other faculty, they didn't want to do it in a professional broadcast studio, which I think um, Laura can talk about how they do that at Princeton. Um, they wanted, they wanted to be be able to record when they when when the spirit moved them, right? So at 3 a.m. that's when they wanted to record. So we, and I hear you, great, and we want the best out of them. If it's three in the morning, that sounds great. But we would set up studios in their office, and it would be permanently there from start to finish. And if something went wrong, we would rush so they'd be ready for the next time they were ready to record. So you know we had to be flexible, open have the infrastructure ready in place so they didn't have to worry about any of the technical glitches, um, but then be flexible when they would have some crazy ideas. So, Laura, did you want to talk about your, your production studio a little bit? So I'm finding out from David Unger, Coursera, um, that there's not many of our partners that actually have a professional broadcast uh, center. <coughs> there is a handful. Um, and I'm finding out from hearing a lot of different uh, stories that we are so lucky to have this great resource at our hand. We can, it's a controlled environment. We can, we can <coughs> get great audio, great video every single time. And so it is a blessing. The problem with it, and uh, maybe even their strategies, is it's not scalable more than, I think we're running six or seven courses at a time, and that's about the limit that's of the schedule of this broadcast center staff and what we can manage at this point. So there, we're looking at other ways as well that faculty can can uh, produce their lectures. But uh, again, scalability is going to be an issue for er even if we go with a uh, screencast option. There still needs to be support for faculty. Um, so. That's where we are. We have a broadcast. They're here. Um, and, uh, and if you want to hear more about them after this um, session, I'm sure they'll entertain your questions. So we've kind of moved on of going beyond the standard ScreenFlow Camtasia webcam solution, which is you know, kind of the kit solution that's on the Coursera website as a starting point. So we're assuming you know what that is. You know how important lighting is. And really, the most important thing is the audio. That's 
the video can look bad, but that audio has got to look awesome for it to kind of feel like it was successful at all. Um, so, so we're going to move on to um, you know ways that we've gone beyond that kind of standard uh, kit solution. And so the broadcast studio was one, and I know Stace has. You know, some quality issues. Yeah, I got, yeah, I got a lot of issues. Um, but yeah, no, um, first of all, yes, yeah, sound is half the picture, right? That's one of the things we talk about um, when we're teaching production at UVA. And it's, it's the most important thing. Um, we have the limitation of, there's actually is a studio at the University of Virginia, it's at our business school, and they are doing some MOOCs out of that. Um, but for the majority of our work, they're not happening in a studio. And that's, that's a mixed blessing. Um, one of the things that, that you just heard was you know, it's great to have that controlled environment and it really is great to have that controlled environment. We also we filmed a 14 week class in the professor's office and we set up a studio in that office for basically a month and a half filming every chance we got because there was a lot of material. Um, one of the problems with that was that every time the elevator arrived on the floors we had to not cut but you know it's like bing bing and we wrestled with, hmm, maybe we should just leave that in so we can get this done before Christmas, right? Um, but we didn't. We didn't because quality is key. And one of the reasons that I, you know, my quality issue that Leslie is talking about is um, my background's in broadcast television. And to me, um, there, there's an intentionality. There's, there's an importance to being, we were talking about this at lunch, paying attention to every pixel in the frame, right? Because anything that's not what you want it to be is not helping you achieve your mission. Right, and it's you know the important thing is learning outcomes, right? So everything that's happening should contribute to that. That doesn't mean that everything necessarily needs to be on purpose, but leaving it in is a decision, right? Leaving it in is a very important decision because hopefully you guys are all doing some kind of editing, right, on on your videos. And um, we had an interesting thing where we had uh, another professor who wants to do all his lectures outside, and UVA is beautiful, so that's a great thing for us to be doing. But a leaf fell and kind of hit him in the face, right? And he just kind of rolled with it and was awesome with it. And so we had this question of do we leave it in, do we take it out? Because every friend, picture's worth a thousand words, right? Well, this is 30 pictures a second. It's a lot of words that, it's a lot of information that you're conveying. And we left it in and it was great because it kept the students engaged. They were like, look at how he did that. I love how he rolls with this stuff. And I love, you know, it really kind of worked with the content of the course of like knowing yourself and kind of knowing yourself in the world. And so for us, you know, quality is really important, editing is really important, but it doesn't mean everything needs to be edited, it doesn't mean everything needs to be perfect, but it needs to matter, that's, that's the important thing for us. And then Libby, you're doing some yeah. great things in your um, So studio. Yeah, so um, I'll just say a couple things about this. One is um, very short and very new. For the first time, um, we just hired a contract artist to do some custom artwork, and actually we're very excited about that. Um, uh, I would like to add in some animations at some point soon, but um, one of the things that we will probably say repeatedly during the session is to be creative and innovative takes time. And so, so far we've been working with fairly short lead times and it's very hard to think about how to be creative and innovative and then put those plans into place if there's not enough lead time. So we kind of struggle with that. Um, in terms of studio versus do-it-yourself kinds of videos, Duke um, does a combination. And the, the combination is to a very large degree at the discretion of the faculty member. Um, so a faculty member generally records his or her own videos using a standardized kit that we check out to them, um, do an orientation for them, help them get it set up, um, and then they use the screen flow, you know, the stuff that, that Leslie was talking about earlier. If they choose, they can ask to have studio time. And Duke does have um, a media services contract group. So we contract with them to do studio or on location work. Um, one really great example of where that was very valuable was for a physics faculty member who was teaching astronomy and he wanted to do some demonstrations. These are demonstrations that he does in his live classroom every semester, every time he teaches this course. Um, what we got out of recording the video that gave us something, and we didn't talk about this during the session, it occurred to me afterwards, but we got something extra from recording that video that he doesn't get in a live classroom, and I think that's really cool. One of his demos, for example, is dropping a slinky from a chair. He stands on a chair, drops a slinky. When you drop a slinky from height, um, it compresses in a way that might not be expected. So in the studio shoot, 
we had several cameras going, including a slow motion one. So when the students in the Coursera class play back that video with the slow motion camera, they get to see that slinky compressing in a way that's not expected. In the live classroom, you can't do that. And that actually we discovered was a very powerful kind of way to think about what can video get you that you don't get in the live classroom. And so at Caltech, we've done some blended things like this as well. We folded in some, um, like the professor would do their own kit in office studio recordings. And then we would shoot B-roll on campus of students walking around at some kind of um, key places on campus. And then we would add that to a module. And we got excellent feedback from the Coursera students that they felt like they were on campus with our students. Um, one instructor was, uh, his module was, was uh, explaining some uh, research that had happened at Caltech, won a Nobel Prize in it, and he ended up teaching it in that lab where it happened and making that connection. So that was a really nice, you know, kind of personal way of, of connecting MOOCs, MOOC students to, to the material. So, and then, uh, Laura, did you have anything else to add on that? Um, then as far as um, how do we scale this, um, yeah, if there's components that the faculty or the TAs can do versus what the high-end production people can do, that definitely helps with scaling. Do you guys have any thoughts on that? How to how to be ready for the scaling? No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, so our next theme is what kind of skills and facilities and time has it taken to support the video aspects of the MOOCs? And then how do you effectively communicate what you need um, to those funders out there, people who are letting you hire people and spend money. Yeah, so I guess I'll start with that one. Um, so skills, facilities, time. Lots of all of those things I think are important. Um, time being the most important because um, one of the things that we, we all I think agree on is that planning is everything, right? And um, the more time that you can spend planning up front, um, so team skills are a really hugely important thing. It doesn't sound very sexy, but it's, it's really important. Um, the basics are really important. So the tools, right? What are the tools that you're using? You're using capture machines like cameras, right? You're using Camtasia. You're using editing applications. I teach Final Cut Pro and Apple Motion, so I'm kind of a big proponent of those things. And one of the things I talk about in all of my classes is it's really important to know those tools well because if you do, you're going to spend a lot less time kind of chasing down the how do I do this and more time just getting the work done. And knowing kind of the minutia of those things is going to allow you to be more creative, right? So if you're not figuring out how to format something in Microsoft Word, you can spend more time just writing, right? And um, I think, of course, video is a lot better than text for most things. Um, but I think it's really important to know those things. Other things are know how your camera works. Spend time with it. Test before you get into a production environment. And then know how your audio equipment works and learn a little bit about lighting. You know, study it. Study portraiture. Study great photographers. And just spend time learning how people do this well because that's how you become good at it, right? That's my two cents on it. So the time required is what I'll touch on real quick. Um, what a lot of instructors don't understand is they're going to know their material better than anybody else. And what we have a, a consistent issue with is at the completion of that video, they're not taking time to review that video before it goes live. They get out of the studio, they think it's great, and they're not looking at it before it gets published online, and then all of a sudden what they thought was good isn't so good. It takes a lot of time and effort to get that video down because it's already been captioned, so that's a whole other process. But to get re-edited into a workflow of a, of, of a staff that's already stretched thin from doing several courses. So I really stress to take the time to review it. Have your TAs view it. Someone, I'm not going to know if you made a mistake. I, I'm not going to know. I'm going to assume that that algorithm was spot on. It's not my <laughs> domain. So um, it gets vetted by 70, 80, 90,000 students. And they've pointed out. and. Um, real quick, but take that time. It's worth every moment you spend to re, uh, revisit your material, your lecture, before we upload it to Coursera. 
I like it. That makes me think of a sort of flipping that a little bit. So this is focusing on you know what skills and capabilities are necessary on the support side, but it made what what Laura was saying made me think of what skills are necessary on the faculty side. So the reviewing of the videos is very important. Um, we have a couple faculty now who are finishing up their videos for a course that's going to start very soon, and they both hate to watch themselves on camera. So getting them to review the videos is really hard, really, really hard. If you, are, um, if you have any flexibility in which faculty are chosen, or if you are among the faculty who are doing the recordings, don't be shy. <laughs> there are going to be thousands of people watching you. You can watch yourself. <laughs> and it's going to really, really help the support people for you to take an active interest in making sure that the videos are what you want them to be. So I'll just, I'll leave it with that. Well, one thing I'll add to that, Libby, is that one of the things that we're doing at UVA, in at least three courses, is we have a course assistant is really not the best. They're really kind of like managing the whole process. But we have a course assistant for each course that we're running that has actually taken that class. And so they are a bit of a subject matter expert. And they're the people that are writing the quiz questions every week, right? So they have to vet those videos. And uh, I, don't, I don't think Brandon's in the room right now. But um, I, I get an email from, from Brandon, who does The Modern World, with me um, you know, once a week when we're working on these, like, OK, there's something that came up in a video that we need to fix, we need to change, we just need a slight edit. And um, that's, that's huge for us because that means what happens is we don't get, you know, 20,000 forum comments that say, hey, you know, he says this here, but then he says this there. And yeah, I mean, it's vetted by the students, right? So having that, that kind of QC in place is a really important part of workflow, right? And I don't know if this is when we talk about the importance of workflow or not, but I think workflow is probably the most important thing you can establish before you actually embark on this process, right? Know what every step is going to be and who's going to be responsible for it. Um, Apple calls that the DRI, the directly responsible individual. Um, and so it's really important to know from A to B to Z what happens with people, what happens with assets, what happens with accountability. And if you have that down before you start the process, you won't have to explore it through the adventure of getting 90,000 forum comments. And you might wonder, well, how does that relate to innovation? Well, it relates really closely. Because if you don't have that plan in place, if you don't know what's going to happen every step along the way, it's going to be really hard to be innovative. Um, it's going to be uh, really difficult to, to, to think outside the box if you don't know what the box is. You know, so, so don't think that this is all just routine stuff. If you want to be creative and innovative, it takes even more planning than it does to use the standard video. Yeah, so before we move, we go to you know, the things that we wish we had in place before we got started, um, I wanted to, to speak to how do we communicate to those at our university as to what we need. And it's, I think we're all finding out what it's taking to create a MOOC course. And, and I know Laura's doing awesome record keeping of how many hours and how many people and the equipment um, with her amazing spreadsheet. Um, for us, everything at Caltech happens because a faculty member wants it to happen. And so if we offer awesome customer service and support and give them the freedom to do what they want to do, then they are the champion without us even asking. So, you know, providing them the infrastructure that they need and giving them the freedom and flexibility to do whatever they're envisioning for their MOOC course. Um, so I don't know if there's, you know, other ways of, I mean, you're giving them data, Laura. If this is what it takes. We're, pro we're trying to provide excellent customer service in a timely way. Yeah. Well, I, as you were talking, Leslie, I was thinking, Duke is really lucky, but Duke is not lucky. We are skilled. <laughs> the, the, the administrators that control the budget streams are skilled at communicating the excitement of this. Mm -hmm. And so we are very um, fortunate in having those skilled administrators because we have very high level, top, top level support for the funding for doing these. Yeah, and what I think uh, one comment to close that is that um, one of the things that in our very first discussions at the University of Virginia was, you know, what, what do these eyeballs mean? What do these MOOCs mean to us as a university, as an institution, right? And it, it came up pretty early in our, our planning meeting that if you look at the numbers, I mean, just the sheer numbers, right, and the time and the, the quality of those eyeballs, I'm talking to like the marketing people here, right, 
um, is you're getting a lot more for the money out of a MOOC than you are for a 30-second spot that's running on a Thursday night ESPN game, right? Like, it's not just the exposure, but the quality of that exposure is incredible. And we're, I mean, for us, one of the things we're seeing is that alumni are really invested in what we're doing in the MOOC process. And I think that's another thing to speak to when you're talking to administrators, or if you are an administrator in the room. I see a couple of guys with ties on. Um, <laughs> you know, that this is really important to you. And, and so it's worth the time, but data is important, and communicating what's needed is, is really key. So Stace is a stickler on quality, and uh, believe me, broadcast quality, if you have the time and the budget, you know, yes. hooray. Um, in many cases, sometimes our faculty weren't starting early enough. I was just so happy to get the content, right, and, and to edit in a way that was the best with what they were giving me. That's not in all cases and not for all instructors either, but there is that fine line of walking. You, you want the authentic content. Some faculty um, probably would not look so good on camera in the studio setting and more of the corporate flat light setting versus in their super company office with their pictures of their family around them and their books. So, yeah, that's also something to consider as well. Um, okay, so the things we wish we had in place before we started, and also any tips and tricks that we want to share um, to get high quality recordings out. So, uh, so I'll start there um, because I have one that was actually pretty basic, and it was I made an assumption when we first started that. Um, our instructors would show up at the broadcast center with their slide deck, their presentation, um, spot on. And I failed to realize, or failed to communicate to them that your four, three slides need to really be in 16 by 9. Um, and it delayed uh, a couple of our sessions. Um, so I wish I had communicated that right away. It would have saved us some time. So if any of your... Um, for any of you involved in the project or you know someone who's getting involved, have them go back through their slide decks. And it, it has a, another benefit, is it allows them to go through these, this, their slides. In many cases, they're using the same lecture slides they've used for years. And go through it and revisit your images. Because those images that you were able to use in your classroom now can't be used. Um, so it, helps them do that and update content. And it kind of forces that. Uh, so 16 by 9 before you shoot. <laughs> and what I wish we had had, although we knew that we didn't have it and put in place consciously a short-term solution, is an asset repository. So we're generating a heck of a lot of assets. Um, we have, uh, we're, we're using shared network space um, to store those on a short-term basis. And we have a project in place now to um, try to identify a product or a way to get good um, asset repository storage with end user friendly interface search and reuse um, capabilities. Um, well, of course, I wish we had more time. Um, <laughs> since I come from an AV group and we're recording things all the time, we already had a workflow of you know, assets and how to archive the assets, so we already have that in place. Um, we needed better mics, so even though we had um, sure mics really, uh, okay, we didn't have the elevator dinging, but we had the CPU of the computer whistling and screaming, and so really the Madonna mics were better mics um, in the end. Um, we had a faculty member who, Again, they want, he wanted to do his own recording, and I just didn't have the PC solution in place uh, ready for him because I just thought everybody was a Mac person. So um, that was one thing I wish I had in place. Um, there's some things with slides besides 16 by 9. If you're going to be doing picture in picture, make sure you've set it up so there's space you know, to put that, that video picture and also room for subtitling and even thinking about keeping things action safe and title safe. Um, and I think you said that you make a template that you share That's right. that has that. Um, so those were, those were some things that we had. Yeah. One more thing I'll add is um, these videos, just because you put them up and, and, and intend for students to watch them in a linear fashion, that's not necessarily how they're going to consume that content. So it's very important to make sure that each segment can stand on its own. Um, so it, 
it improves student learning that way. So um, that that is helpful to know when you go through and you, you're ready to say this is lecture one, segment one, or whatever, however your naming convention is, that you remember that. That helps with the planning process as well, I think, yeah. One other thing I just remembered that I wish we'd had is research data about how quality and other aspects of video affect learning outcomes. Not user satisfaction, but actual learning outcomes. Um, we have a great assessment person, Yvonne um, Bellinger, who you may know from her, um, her uh, assessment of our first MOOC. Um, and she investigated that question, and it just didn't seem like there was much data out there. But it'd be really nice to know, does the studio quality affect learning outcomes versus the do-it-yourself? Does the duration, is there, a, is there a limit? Is there a, an upper maximum number of minutes where students stop paying attention? Those kinds of things would be really, really good to have. Yeah, one thing I want to add to that is that we have that conversation at UVA all the time, like what's better, what's more authentic, what's helping with learning outcomes, right? I, there were some interesting examples in the last uh, presentation in this room of different styles. And I think one thing that's really important is that there is no magic bullet. I, I, I would argue that you can't just say, OK, well, this style works better and improves learning outcomes. Because it's that style with that talent and that content on that day, yeah. right? And what you decided to leave in and what you decided to edit out. These things are all really important. So I think that data is essential. There's no doubt about it. But at the same time, um, it's, I don't want to say just go with your guts, right? Because this is an academic setting. Um, but there is something to that, right? What, what works for you? I mean, we're all in education here. We all know how education works, and we all have seen really bad teaching, right? So, I mean, you know when things are good, you know when things are bad, and stand up for the stuff that's good, right? Fight for it, because if you do, you'll get it, and your students will be better off. Um, I have kind of an old school thing that we had to learn the hard way. So we're moving big files across campus. Professor records in their office, they send it to us via Dropbox, and in the end, it would just be faster to sneaker net it on a drive, which is what we ended up doing. So walking it across campus to us, or meeting at the coffee house and doing the exchange of the drive. So um, how fast is your is your network? How fast is your switch? And got another backup then, right? Exactly. OK, so our last is a, is a show and tell, um, and some things that we're excited about doing over the next six months. So the two very short things that we would like to explore are whether or not we can make a simple green screen capability available for the do-it-yourself videos. We have a collapsible portable one that we're going to experiment with. With green screen stuff, lighting matters completely. And so we're not sure whether we can get it set up for the do-it-yourself videos, but we want to explore that. And the second thing is we would like to do um, as appropriate, that is we're in the courses where it would add um, to the content. We would like to do more of the custom artwork and add in some animated animation, again, as appropriate for the course. We're looking at the possibility of creating um, smaller studios, studio pods, if you will, um, where our professional staff can, can set these rooms up with controlled audio, controlled uh, uh, lighting, and an instructor can come in and this controlled environment, hopefully hit an easy button and begin. Um, and that, where it saves in resources, it takes resources to, to equip these rooms, but it saves in terms of man, uh, the actual uh, human resource that is already you know, pushed to the limit. But if we can do something like that and get good quality, um, I think it's really going to pay off for Princeton. Yeah, very much. Um, at the University of Virginia, we're kind of still figuring out what we're going to be doing next semester. So I'm figuring out what I'm going to be doing this summer. Um, but I know a couple of the things that we're looking at are taking, taking video presentations that are graphically intense and had a lot of screen capture that doesn't really capture a very high resolution. And then the video compression kind of further beats it up, right? So we're going to take some of those and look at how we can reanimate, like, you know, finessed maps and things like that. So one of the things that I'm excited about that is we've got this kind of great foundation for it with the tablet and screen capture that we we don't have to get the professor back in because their time is really valuable to say, OK, what do we do here? We can just follow what we record and then recreate that in After Effects or Apple Motion. I'm a motion user. Um, and then the other thing we're going to be exploring is more location work, um, whether it's, we don't know if it's going to be kind of 
out on the lawn or doing a Tibetan studies class in Tibet, depending on the political environment this summer. Um, but you know, it's, it's it's the big thing is kind of expanding the scope of this, dreaming big, and then kind of bringing it down to what's practical and achievable. Um, so our first MOOC that we did was actually in front of a live classroom, and we did a live stream of it. So that's kind of our show and tell um, of a live broadcast of 18 one-hour lectures. Um, there were about 300 students that were part of the live broadcast, t uh, text chatting and questions that then the TA would you know, pull up the, the good questions and address to the professor. And so they're out of that real-time Q&A connection with the faculty member. Um, which was really special and it worked amazingly well. So if you have any questions about how we did that, and I'm, I'm happy to share it. It was also part of the recording. So of course not everybody can be in sync with uh, Pacific Standard Time. So um, then that was just part of a MOOC module that you could experience even though you weren't there. Um, the other nice thing about that is um, maybe students in the class weren't asking questions, but once those MOOC students started asking, maybe starting simple questions, that got all questions rolling. And that was a great thing to feed back to our university. Um, so our university is kind of near Hollywood. So one of the things that we're thinking about doing on one of our rerun uh, MOOCs, um, our Galaxies and Cosmology class, is taking one of the short modules um, that we have a transcript for that the professor taught and having an actress read it. Um, you know, we do educational <laughs> outreach videos um, all the time, and Hollywood talent comes in. Cameron Diaz did one for us. Um, for any of you gaming folks, uh, Felicia Day has done some things uh, with our uh, with our team over at Caltech. And then the second time we run it, you offer, you know, watch version A or watch version B, and you don't tell them and see is the learning different. You offer the same quizzes. It's the same material. Um, we did pose this question uh, to the Coursera students um, just to see if they'd be open to, to it. And unanimously, they said, we want the professor to teach it. So isn't that interesting? They wanted the authenticity. So it's still like an interesting um, experiment to do and see what comes out of it. So we're now open uh, for your Q&A and some discussion. We'd love to know what you're doing. Yes. Uh, my name is Terry Matilski. I'm from Rutgers University. I'm do more than Asking for. Um, <laughs> uh, I have so many questions, and one of the, I mean, I know George Dragovsky is doing one of those courses, and I haven't done this yet, and I just have questions about whether or not, for instance, Charles Severance at U of M has a nice little setup with a webcam that's easily, in, you know, integrated with Camtasia. Whereas I'm thinking go with the high depth stuff that Coursera recommends, and they even have green screen capabilities there. And um, what do I do? I mean, what? I mean, how do you decide which of those options yeah, you choose? Yeah, right, if we're going to be doing this for the first time. What do you want? I think that's the big. What do you want out of that? That's also start with the end. end. Okay. Yeah. I think that what I'm going to have is a lot of outside video. And in fact, I'm worried, actually, I think, Stace, you brought this up. This is going to be some old stuff, like Winky Dink. I don't know if anybody knows. You don't even remember Winky Dink, but that's all right. Or yeah. maybe you know this. <laughs> Willie, Willie, Willie Mays demonstrating gravity by making that incredible catch in 1954. Mm -hmm. How does that go in a class if it's filmed with virtually no resolution, and all of a sudden you're going to put it in a high-def video scene. Should I forget about that? No, I, I think, well, I think, I'll, I'll jump on that one because it sounds like a quality question. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think, you know, first of all, like, we always work backward, like what do we want the result to be, and then what's the movie magic that we put together to make that happen, right? And you know, it's you're always wrestling with budgets and time and things like that. And I think the f the first thing you got to do is partner with somebody that that knows this stuff at your institution or in your neighborhood, right? Um, and you know, there you mentioned another course on Coursera. How does he do that? Send him an email. You know, ask him. This is a really participant community, I think. And and so it's. There's no simple answer to your question. There's no question about that. But I think again, it goes to partnering with somebody that knows what they're doing. If if it's you know local staff, make sure you guys know the tools so that you can figure these things out. 
right? Learn what you need to know to build this thing. And, and sometimes you just have to test. If you want to know what that video clip, if you have copyright permission to use it, yep. is like, <laughs> <laughs> sorry, had to sneak yeah, that in. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So be, do be sure about that. If you do have permission to use it, then try it and see what it looks like once it's uploaded. Um, Coursera provides play space, so it gives you a chance to test it. Um, if it doesn't work, then think about an animation um, to portray it in a different way. I want to say I'm on the phone with our general counsel every day about some copyright issue okay. with MOOCs. So there's a question with the woman in the black sweater. Um, I had a question. Uh, I produce, my name's Colin Cook. I work for the University of Illinois producing videos for Coursera in our online courses. And you guys didn't talk a whole lot about pre-production. And at least in our unit and our crew, the big thing that we're noticing is our production time is now becoming kind of the least of our worries and that the more time we're spending in pre-production working with the faculty, figuring out what content we need to get cleared for copyright, <laughs> or just kind of working through their, their stuff, we're spending a lot of time almost doing instructional design with the faculty as video producers. Can you kind of talk about your experiences with that? We are, we are, doing, the same, we are doing the same thing. Um, but because the workshop was focused on the, you know, our, our, the, the recording of the lecture strategy, we didn't touch on it. But the McGraw Center uh, for Teaching and Learning is leading the project. Um, we meet with faculty uh, to get all of that stuff, you know, the, what they, what they're, what they want to teach, how they want to teach it. We start backwards. What do you want students to learn? Go back, design, you know, have an idea in mind before we ever hit the studio, um, and that it makes that process more efficient. I absolutely agree. Pre-production is everything but i think people in that in the industry will tell you the same thing i don't think there's anyone uh, in broadcast will say that pre-production is the least important it is absolutely the most important um, and it will help make the rest of the workflow a lot more effortless. <coughs> and at duke we are we are very lucky that we have two groups working together in collaboration the center for instructional technology that does the pedagogical consulting and the office of information technology that does the video stuff and we work in concert with each other. There's a question in the purple tie. Hi. Um, yeah, we're, I'm Carlin Wallach from Northwestern University. We're one of the institutions that just came on, the 27 that came on last month. My video, my video, welcome. <laughs> great. Uh, my video group has been tasked with uh, supporting these. So I want to paraphrase something and ask a question. The first thing I'm paraphrasing is, so everything we know about production of video across the board, from didactics all the way up to long form, um, uh, documentary applies here is the message. This is a, this is just another aspect of people watching TV, which everyone in America has a PhD in. Correct. That's where we're at. Second question is this: I've heard each one of you talk about your videos and aligning them to the learning outcomes and the AB solutions and all these pieces. How is Coursera, which I know has all of this click-through data? How are you getting that data back? And how are you relating that data to the videos you're, you're crafting? So you're talking about the analytics that Coursera is collecting. Yeah. Um, so we're still waiting. We've requested. Um, they do share you know, large data sets. Um, but we haven't gotten it yet. Because this is what I want to see. But it's what coming. I want to understand is this. I mean, You've do, yeah, David, do you varieties. have anything to say about that? They are collecting the data. Um, there isn't a, a beautiful front interface. There's this, you know, huge data set that you can sort through. But we're still waiting on it for our economics class for sure. We have a faculty member who's just, yeah. I mean, and what, cause what I really want to see from the production side is every one of you are doing different things. You've got all these different pieces, all these different approaches. And it appears to me they're all valid in some way, anecdotally. That's the research piece that I crave. Yeah, we yeah. I think all four of us. Because that. we need that, right? Okay, Coursera guy, get on that. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, David and Coursera. Coursera. <laughs> but I have confidence. I mean, I, right? I mean, you know, I mean, we can get we can get all of us from uh, the dashboard uh, the basic information. You know, uh, the number of times the video has been watched, the number of times it's been downloaded. Um, how many unique visitors are, um, or unique students are watching the video? What we want at a more granular level is um, 
how how many how often they watch the video? Did they did, like you said their click stream? When did they pause it and all that? Because we can really start analyzing um, and trying to figure out why did you stop watching the video? What was right. you know we can improve our videos if we know or improve our lectures if we can get more information from that. Um, right. We welcome and, that. And I would like to know how the all that all that data compares to quiz results and things like that. Yeah. I mean, because that's what we really need to be at. Um, I know for a fact with the non-MOOC videos that we've done, what we've seen is when we're compressing the length instead of a 40-minute video, which has a few hundred video views down to a seven-minute video, video where we get 3,000 views, I know where our sweet spot is in our other work. But Coursera should have, what, 3.75 million data points about this? Yeah, there's a lot of data points. It doesn't mean they're all significant, though. And I think that's one of the problems. And what are the meaningful correlations of those data points? And also, and this is something that I, I run up against all the time. Yes, a three-minute video, much easier to download, all of that. We, we run an average of two and a half hours a week in the modern world history class. People love it. So there's this argument that shorter is better. Mm, I just don't think there's a magic bullet to any of this stuff, right? It's not to say that data isn't important, right? And, the, and that understanding that data, which is the bigger question, isn't important. But again, I think you've got to take that information in context, right? And and you know, support it with with other things and t take a look at the big picture, not just like what are these numbers these particular numbers for this particular class with this particular professor telling me. Well, right? and in fact, what yeah. I really want is not just the Coursera data as it relates right. to things like that. I want a controlled study. I want yeah. to take the same yeah. content, you know, and with different yeah. quality, yeah. different yeah. lengths, mix it in different yeah. ways, and do observational study, and not sort of, uh, those kinds of things. I think I think that's a big piece that we're missing in the video, educational video world at large. So we only have a few more minutes. I think we should do the rest of the discussion as at our uh, reception. But I wanted to make sure that we got our hot tip from each of our panelists. So, uh, Libby, I'll start with you. Time, time, time. Allow time. <laughs> <laughs> so what is it? Rush crushes creativity. There right. we go. Yeah. Um, so I have uh, two. Um, establish naming conventions uh, for your um, assets. Uh, it's going to be critical. Um, establish them, right? Uh, Princeton, we use the uh, canonical name, the short name of the course, um, and then the lecture number in segment one. So uh, comp arch dash L for lecture, zero one for the, for the number lecture, and dash S one for the segment one. Um, and for their PDFs or, or other um, ancillary materials that you that you upload and provide, we do the same thing. Uh, we give it that canonical short name and where it came from because you're going to want it and you want to find it efficiently. So um, that's number one tip. Um, preach on that. Um, preach, sister. Preach on that. Uh, the other is have a strategy for storage and archiving your your um, video segments. They're, they're so, they're, your video assets. Video assets are huge by their very nature, right? Uh, we can't keep everything. And D David, I know, will love to talk to you about the enormous uh, file size. We, uh, we have an impressive um, uh, storage uh, system, and uh, we can't keep everything. You know, at some point, you, we have to uh, parse. And that goes in contrast with what my friend Elizabeth <laughs> says, who is uh, an archivist at heart, keep everything. And I don't. I think you need a policy, and it either is going to come top down, or it's it's got to be established in some way. Well, I'll range short on time. So two things: learn your tools, right, as we discussed. And the other thing is, if you uh, are an iOS device user and use iBooks, there's a book out uh, by Nancy Duarte. Uh, Duarte Design Firm in Sunnyvale does uh, all of Apple's keynote design, right? So the book is called Resonate, and uh, it's Duarte D U A. D-U-A-R-T-E. Mm -hmm. Just Google it. And the one before that is Slideology. Slideology, exactly. So kill your PowerPoint and start wanting better for yourself. And then my uh, tip is don't balk at craziness because that's where the innovation comes, when the ideas of, I want to live broadcast this, and you're just thinking of the, the support that's required and the madness of that. That's usually where the innovation happens.
thank you. thank you everyone for coming.